Um, so first of all, just a little blurb about where I'm from, because you may not all have heard of the Natural Resources Research Institute. It's part of the University of Minnesota Duluth, and we have a couple facilities, and we work on a whole wide range of things, um, forestry, geology, um, developing all different kinds of chemicals from natural extractives like birch bark and stuff. Um, up in Coleraine, they do a lot with the mining industry. And how do I get the slides to go forward? That's interesting. There we go. Um, and so our charter and mission is to try to find um, sustainable solutions and ways that Minnesota's natural resources can be used in a very sustain sustainable way, which is in, um, a challenge, right? <laughs> so this is my team. Um, and as I said, we're the Freshwater Ecosystem Research and Monitoring Lab, and I work primarily on aquatic invertebrates, but Josh, my second in command, um, he's a fisheries ecologist, so we got the fisheries side covered as well. Holly and Bob are great taxonomists. Um, Carrie's our field team leader. Um, and Katja is awesome at uh, our code and all the data analysis that we need to do. Um, so we have a great team, but we focus on, on the fish and the bugs. So if you start asking me lots of plant questions, I may go, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but what I wanted to talk to you about today and why you asked me here is about our Great Lakes Coastal Wetland Monitoring Project and all that we're doing with that in general and around assessing um, the restorations that have been done under GLRI. So we are also funded by GLRI and uh, have been since 2010. The monitoring actually started in 2011. Don Uzarski out of Central Michigan University um, is the lead PI. I manage everything for him. So I'm the coordinator of the entire program and the QC manager, which is actually kind of an important task. We'll get into that in a bit. So this is a fun slide. If you haven't seen this, you know, everybody's like, oh, the Atlantic coast, the Pacific coast, there's so much coastline. It's like, you know what? Great Lakes has a lot of coastline too. So what somebody did is they took the Im images of the Great Lakes and just lined the U.S. side of all the Great Lakes as coastline down the eastern seaboard, um, Lake Michigan, because the, it's on both sides, the U.S. owns both sides, um, is split in two here. So we actually, even just in this visual image, like we have more coastline than the Atlantic coast. So it's a fun visual if um, you ever need to make that point to everybody. So we talk about Great Lakes coastal wetlands and we roughly divide Great Lakes coastal wetlands into three groups. And I'm just gonna sell you on coastal wetlands a little bit because I think a lot of folks mostly work on inland wetlands, which are great, but coastal wetlands are really cool too. Um, so we roughly divide coastal wetlands into three groups and it gets really squishy because most coastal wetlands are don't fit neatly into one category and many have all three categories within them. But the ones that are riverine, so sort of at uh, um, drowned river mouths um, or have a river flowing into them, the ones that are just sort of the barrier beach systems, and then the ones that are the lacustrine, they're just basically open to the power of the Great Lakes. And those tend to form in more protected areas, and you can see by um, their arrangement here around the Great Lakes where they are. You'll also note that um, there are places that are just really rugged and don't have very many coastal wetlands in them. So as I said, three types of coastal wetland. Um, it's really hard to get a handle on how many coastal wetlands there are. Like if somebody asked you how many pothole wetlands there are in Minnesota, you'd probably say in a drought year or in a wet year, right? And we have that same kind of problem with coastal wetlands, as well as the fact that, of course, small ones disappear because people do things to them and all that. So there's like maybe 2,000-ish. Um, in our project, we're looking at all of them, including um, a little bit up the, the tributaries, and I'll talk about that a little bit too, um, and uh, along the connecting channels, which some folks don't do. So you all know how important wetlands are. Coastal wetlands are equally important, um, and particularly, a lot of people don't know this, for Great Lakes fish species. Over 80 species of Great Lakes fish 
use coastal wetlands at some point in their life cycle, especially for spawning and nursery areas. So all those fish that people love to go fishing for in the Great Lakes, a whole bunch of them um, either depend on the coastal wetlands themselves or the fish that they eat depend on coastal wetlands. And of course, you know, the birders love coastal wetlands and um, those that are into amphibians and reptiles too. But like everything else, we've lost so many coastal wetlands across the Great Lakes. Um, I think Lake Erie's lost 80% of their coastal wetlands. Overall, it's across the Great Lakes, it's about 50% if you average it all out to the, you know, normal things, <laughs> nutrient pollution, invasive species, fragmentation, and just, you know, diking them and draining them and paving them over and that sort of thing. Where coastal wetlands differ a little bit from um, inland wetlands, inland wetlands go through their, their hydrologic cycles, but coastal wetlands follow the Great Lakes hydrologic cycle if they're allowed to. Um, and of course we have those weird stations which cause those water level changes um, throughout uh, days or weeks, um, which also make them pretty dynamic systems. And so you have to be able to follow, the plants need to be able to follow that dynamism, which of course is uh, one of the problems that we have on some of the Great Lakes, but the plants need to be allowed to migrate upslope and migrate downslope. And you know, you all know this from wet and dry years, um, of course, with inland wetlands as well, if you don't work on, on coastal wetlands. Um, and so if you look at a lake that's you know, relatively unregulated, like Lake Superior, it, it is regulated a little bit in its water levels, but it just takes the edge off the highs and the lows for Lake Superior. Um, you can see that the water levels, you know, they have annual cycles and they have decadal cycles, and um, that's pretty much not tamped down. Versus Lake Ontario, which is very controlled um, in its water levels, and once the, you can see pre, can you see my cursor? Yes, we can. Yep. Okay, perfect. So pre-installation of the big dams and regulation, you can see the decadal cycles going on here in Lake Ontario, and then boom, <laughs> look at how much those cycling cycles are tamped down. Now they can't tamp them down completely as the flooding of a few years ago um, illustrated, but um, that just the tamping down that they did um, caused massive changes in the coastal wetlands on Lake Ontario because they just don't, don't experience the same range of, of highs and lows as they used to. That greatly reduced the vegetative diversity in those coastal wetlands. Um, and so coastal wetlands here on Lake Superior, we are very lucky, are way more diverse than coastal wetlands on Lake Ontario. And of course, Lake Ontario has the added problem of having a lot more nutrient pollution than Lake Superior has as well. So we restricted that, that amplitude um, on those coastal wetlands. And um, I don't work a whole lot on Lake Superior, but what the researchers out there tell me is that, you know, mostly their cattails, so there's just dry land, which goes into a cattail zone, which goes then in deeper water into basically SAV. And you don't have much of anything else. And your, your emergent zone is pretty much all cattails. They don't even have Phragmites there. For some reason, this keeps Phragmites out, which is, I guess, the one, one of the few saving graces for wetlands of um, this intense water level regulation. So when we first started this project, one of the first things we had to figure out is, okay, so we're supposed to sample all the coastal wetlands. Hmm, where are they? How many are there? Can we do this? Um, and so, as I said, we think there's about 2,000 coastal wetlands. Um, and what we ended up doing is saying, okay, there's about a thousand of them that we can sample. And so what we're not sampling are the really little coastal wetlands. So things less than four hectares. They, um, the water level dynamism for those is so great because they're so small that you, know, you can spend a lot of time sending a field crew there and it's either drowned out or dry land that year or it's just gone because they're so small. Those are the ones that are easy to drain and pave over and whatever else happens to them. Um, so we're sampling the thousand biggest coastal wetlands across the whole Great Lakes. And you can see that on the US side, we have a lot more than on the Canadian side. And that I th we think a lot of that is just due to the topography 
of the Great Lakes. The, the Canadian side for Lake Superior is much more rugged as it is for some of the other Great Lakes as well. Um, and in Lake Huron, um, up in Georgian Bay, they seem to be experiencing still a lot of glacial rebound. Um, and um, there's not, in some places, the, the, the wetlands just can't migrate up and down slope as easily, even if humans haven't done a lot, and Georgian Bay is one of those places. So there's just um, a lot of difference between the U.S. side and the Canadian side. But we sample both sides of the border. Um, we have Canadian collaborators as well. And speaking of collaborators, so this is the collaboration group that is running the Great Lakes Coastal Wetland Monitoring Program. Um, so the big red star in the middle, that's Beaver Island, where Don Uzarski is based at least in the summertime. Um, Central Michigan has a field station there. And we have teams all across the basin. So my team over in Duluth is the westernmost team, although Denny Albert is actually at Oregon State University. He's a famous veg guy from Michigan, and he still works with a Michigan team, even though he had to move to Oregon. Um, but we're technically the westernmost team here in Duluth. And then we have teams all the way out uh, to as far as Brockport um, that sample all the way to the uh, St. Lawrence Seaway, and we stop at the St. Lawrence Seaway. We do all the other connecting channels, but again, we can only do so much, so we did have to draw the line somewhere, so we don't, um, we don't sample past uh, the St. Lawrence, or into the St. Lawrence Seaway. So we're trying, so these teams are trying to sample a thousand wetlands across the entire Great Lakes coastline every five years. So we sample roughly 200 wetlands per year. Now, the way we set this up, so we're being asked, we're being, we were set up as one of those long-term monitoring programs that US EPA runs. And so, you know, they've had um, the monitoring on the Great Lakes from the ships for many years. The ships go out every spring and every fall, and they do, they hit, they hit all these same stations, and they do this routine sampling. Same thing is being done in streams and rivers across the United States. They do that routine EMAP sampling for monitoring for trends, and they're getting it going in inland lakes, so we're trying to get it going in inland wetlands. Same idea for Great Lakes coastal wetlands. So we're going to try to sample all the wetlands every all the major wetlands every five years and keep an idea on status and trends um, and so we have to very carefully balance that design because wetlands are not evenly distributed across the great lakes and so we couldn't just randomly throw them in a pool and randomly draw out 20 percent because you know you you'd end up with um, some years mainly sampling <laughs> wetlands in the lower part of the basin because there aren't as many in the upper part of the basin. So we really carefully stratified everything and did it just super careful draw so that we're sampling a balanced set of wetlands in each region. So every to every five years we're actually sampling one fifth of the wetlands up in the sparsest region, just like we're sampling one fifth of the wetlands that are down in the, well, I should say, um, where's the densest region for coastal wetlands? Probably in here actually. Um, the other thing is we're trying to get a handle on year-to-year -year variation and what that does to our indicators. And so we take 10% of our wetlands each year and we go back the next year to those. So we sample 10% of the wetlands two years in a row um, so that we can look at interannual variability and what that's doing to our data and to our indicators. Um, the other thing is we have to be careful about sampling too much. Um, you know, dragging fike nets around, which is how we sample the fish, trampling around to sample the veg. If you do it too much, you could actually become your own impact. Um, so there are a few sites that are very long-term research sites that we sample every single year, but in those, you can see our transects on satellite <laughs> because we've trampled them down so many years in a row. Um, so we are cognizant of that. Um, so that's our, that's our study design. What we sample are the biota. We are, we are not focusing on water chemistry in this sampling. We are asking the biota, how are they doing in these wetlands? What is their impression of how each wetland is doing? And so Water chemistry is a secondary variable that's more of a, a backup, um, you know, an explanatory variable. It's not the primary thing that we're chasing. 
And so we do birds, anurans, which are all the calling amphibians, the aquatic vegetation, the aquatic macroinvertebrates, the fish, and then we do water chemistry and habitat um, just as a, a backup or not a backup, as um, secondary variables to help explain what we're seeing with the biota. So the way we do this, and this is, um, this is a real coastal wetland, but you know, a simpler one to sample because it's just one nice shaped bay. Um, and so I just wanted to walk you through the basics of how the sampling occurs by all teams in a coastal wetland, and then I'll go into the methods in a bit more detail. Um, so, first of all, the bird and anurin folks, they hike in from land and stand on shore and listen. So they do listening surveys, and this is based in the spring breeding season. So we're not concentrating on waterfowl. We are concentrating on passerine wetland birds that, um, that nest in coastal wetlands. And then, of course, the frogs and toads uh, in their spring, um, their um, spring breeding season. So they're, so they're coming in from land. And so their access issues are, is it private property? Can we get across it? Can we hike in safely at four in the morning uh, when they have to be there? Or for the anurans, uh, the frogs and toads, can we hike out safely um, after dark? Um, the rest of us come in from the lakeside in boats or canoes. Uh, the vegetation people often work in canoes. And so they do these transects. So they do three transects from the outer edge of vegetation all the way up to the driest edge on land. And these little squares are where they do their quadrats. If the zonation is really super compressed, they'll spread their little quadrats out in a transect that goes uh, horizontal with the uh, depth gradient rather than perpendicular, but they prefer this particular layout if they if they have the space. So they do three transects. They do uh, one, two, five, I think five, either five or six quadrats, one meter square quadrats uh, of vegetation in each uh, in each of the three zones, the um, these are the, the the wet meadow, the emergent zone, and the submergent zone. Um, oh, here's an, sorry, here's an example of how they had to turn a transect sideways. Um, so then we have the fish and macroinvertebrates, and we set our nets um, to be fully within vegetation morphotypes, and I'll talk more about that in a minute, but we're thinking about the vegetation as structure and habitat for the fish and invertebrates, not like the veg crew is doing and they're looking for diversity and all that sort of stuff. Um, so we take uh, three fike nets and three macroinvertebrate samples in each vegetation morphotype, and uh, those are replicates. Um, okay, so just to go over this in just a little bit more detail, so this is Eloise Bay here uh, in the Superior area, um, and so you can see there's they're not much of a wet meadow zone, but we get a nice emergent zone going into the submergent zone, which continues way out, and you can't see it because Eloise Bay is so turbid. Um, but again, they would set out their three transects and try to really get a good estimate or a good um, characterization of all the different types of vegetation that occurs. We sample the fish with passive trap nets called fike nets. Um, as I said, these are set in vegetation morphotypes. We try not to sample edge. Um, so this is probably, this is a submergent, some kind of a submergent vegetation that we're sampling here. Um, they're set for only one night. So I should have said, this is really spot sampling. The burden and urine people come back um, three times for each, uh, each type, either birds or urines. The rest of us only visit the site basically one day and every five years and that's our snapshot sampling so it truly is snapshot sampling kind of like emap um so we set the net overnight pull it pull set the nets overnight pull them the next day identify all the fish measure the first 25 of each species um and that's the fish 
The invertebrate sampling we're collecting with DNets, attempting to make it semi-quantitative by counting every sweep, and every sweep is very standardized in how much area it covers. Again, we're taking from vegetation morphotypes, three reps in each of the top three to four dominant morphotypes in the um, in the wetland, and we only sample morphotypes that are big enough to not be like all edge. So um, roughly, you, you need roughly about 200 to 400 square meters of vegetation of the same type to call it a, a morphotype. We actually field pick, um, live pick uh, 150 organisms from each replicate sample, and then those are identified back in the lab. Um, not my preferred method, but the IBIs work well for this, and um, it um, it's the IBIs are predicated on us not being able to catch everything and and that sort of thing. We do not do zooplankton where there wasn't enough money to do zooplankton or algae um, in this project. And then, as I said, we take habitat and water chemistry as sort of backup secondary variables. Um, and so we use meters to get, you know, temperature dissolved oxygen, all the normal stuff. Uh, and then we do grab samples for chlorophyll A and the nutrients, turbidity chloride, those sorts of things. Um, we also take sediment cores to texture the sediment types and get an idea of organic matter content because that's a good, sort of a good measure of productivity. You know, sometimes nutrient sampling can be kind of fleeting, especially for the most available nutrients because there's so much turnover in those pools. Um, but the amount of um, biomass, of organic biomass built up in the sediment can be a good surrogate of productivity. And then we do our own little quadrat to just assess the density of the aquatic vegetation and the basic types um, for where we set our fike nets. So you can just see the edge of a fike net um, um, lead line here. Um, we often can't identify it very well because we're fish and bug people, so we're often coming back with handfuls of vegetation going to the veg people. What is this? So please tell me what was there. Um, so with all that, and we try to do everything exactly the same way across the entire basin, every team from Duluth to the St. Lawrence, um, St. Lawrence River, and that's where I as QA manager really have to be a little bit draconian to be honest it's like i don't care if you think it would be scientifically interesting to do something to do something different <laughs> this is the way we're all doing it so that all the data is comparable all the way across the basin if you wanted to and you thought there was a reason to you could compare the data from a wetland in duluth exactly to the data from a wetland at the far eastern end of lake ontario and the methods should be exactly comparable um, so we do a lot of qc Boy, do we do a lot of QC. So what do you get? Um, so first of all, here's a map of the sites that we sampled just this past summer. And so you can see we really tried to spread out our sampling across the entire basin. Um, we hit Isle Royale this year. We can't go there every year because it's too expensive, but we went there this year. Um, and the other thing I want to point out is that we can't get all crews to all wetlands. So all these wetlands got sampled for something. So all the ones with the green dots, all the teams got there. But, um, you know, this year, the burden and urine teams couldn't get to Isle Royale. Um, there are some, and the bird and amphibian teams, even though they visit the site five times, they can still move way faster than we can because even if they're doing five points, they're only staying at each point for, I think, 15 minutes. Whereas we spend in, we fish and bug people spend an entire day at a site um, by the time we set the nets and then pull them the next day and blah, blah, blah. So they can do about 200 sites a year, the bird and inurant people. The rest of us can do about 125. So they get to more sites than we do. But there are some sites that um, that they can't get to. There's permission issues because they come in by land, whereas we don't have that because we come in by boat. Um, so there's those sorts of, of things as well that make it, you know, well, I want to say random, but a little bit random in which sites are sampled for which types of things. And here's just um, a sh an overview of 
all the sites that were sampled in one five-year round. So this is 2016 to 2020. It was our second five-year round of doing Great Lakes Coastal Wetland Monitoring. And you can see that we did sample about a thousand wetlands um, in that five-year time period. And it also shows you where the wetlands tend to be located. So what do we get? Um, so we've been doing this for about is it 13 years now, um, 12 years, I always lose count. Anyways, a lot of years. Um, and so we can, we can, you know, compile data that, you know, show you the average number of bird taxa by, in, in wetlands of each, of each lake, mins and maxes, um, that sort of thing. So it's these overall averages that allow you to say, oh, look, Lake Huron and Lake Superior have more bird taxa in their wetlands than, uh, or a, few, a little bit more than Lake Ontario and uh, Lake Michigan, you know, that sort of, of thing. We also, as I have mentioned a couple times, create indicators. Um, so the bird and, and neuron indicators are called indicators of ecological condition. It's, um, it's, a, it's a different way of creating an indicator. It's not your standard IBI. I can't explain it very well, but I will attempt it. What they do is they look at the occurrence of all the species across all the wetlands and um, compare that to the landscape stressors and um, the water chemistry data that we are getting, the water quality data that we are getting, and create a, um, um, an occurrence, sort of an occurrence graph. And that shows that, okay, these species are most common in wetlands that are here on the stressor gradient and have these characteristics for uh, nutrients and things like that. And you create then this predictive predictive metric that says, okay, for a wetland of this type, it ought to have these birds, um, and then does it or doesn't it. Um, I, it I'm probably really screwing this up, but it's, a, it's kind of a complicated, <laughs> kind of a complicated indicator. Um, at any rate, so you can see that we get these indicators of the condition, and of course, it's a typical stoplight colors, really good condition in darker green, degraded condition in red. Um, and you know you get wetlands that look really different in condition to the birds just right next to each other because of different the way they respond to the vegetative habitat and other things that are going on at those sites. Um, and we do this all the indicators separately because you know the birds perceive wetland condition very differently than say a fish does. And while I suppose we technically could combine them all into one number, and at first everybody was asking us to do that. It didn't make a lot of sense to us because why would you ever combine what the birds think and what the fish think about a site? Because they could be diametrically opposite. It just doesn't make a lot of sense to us. So we haven't done that. Um, speaking of fish, the other thing we do is we, we look at non-natives, um, and so we can keep track of how invaded wetlands are across lakes. Now I say the caveat of, remember, we're there one day a year, and that's all we've got is that one day snapshot. So we're not catching probably all the invasive fish that could be in a wetland. Um, but we're doing it the same way across the entire basin. So you can compare the data, even though you wouldn't want to say absolutely, oh, hey, you know, on average, every wetland in Lake Erie only has one non-native fish. Um, I would be careful about that one. In our study, they do. Um, here's vegetation uh, condition, and this one, um, you know, because of, as I mentioned at the beginning, how the wetland vegetation really responds to the dynamics of the Great Lakes and also the nutrients, you get this real split in condition with the northern part of the basin looking so much better than sites in the southern part of the basin, and particularly sites where the water level is greatly controlled, such as on Erie and Ontario. Um, we track invasives again for the macrophytes, and I'm a little more confident <laughs> about the invasives because they can't run away. The veg, the veg just don't get up and run away from you or swim away from you. Um, so we're more likely to find 
decent sized patches of invasive species, not that we find every little tiny new invasion, but we have been responsible for reporting a lot of new invasions of fish, vegetation, and aquatic invertebrates at sites across the Great Lakes, just because we're out there. And there aren't that many other people out in the wetlands doing research. And you can do things like this um, plot, you know, the number of wetlands that are invaded by how many species. And you can see, you know, we have a few wetlands that are invaded by nine different invasive macrophyte uh, species. Um, for Michigan, a few years ago, we did a special report where we looked at um, the number of invasive species versus uh, the number of containing species at risk. Um, and so it's pretty interesting, even though there are highly invaded sites that still have um, quite a lot of at-risk species in them. So that's, um, that's interesting. I don't know what else to say about it because I'm not a veg person, but it's interesting. And we were able to plot things like all the invasives um, across the Great Lakes. So this is all invasives combined. So it's vegetation, fish, aquatic invertebrates. Um, not there aren't really invasive anurans, and the bird folks are having trouble defining what an invasive bird is. So, um, so we haven't done that, attempted that yet. Um, and then finally, we, we do have an indicator based on water quality and land use conditions. So it's a combined indicator using both wetland water quality right on the ground on the site, and then the general condition of the landscape right around it. It's sort of its drainage shed, if you will, of each wetland. Um, this indicator is a little bit more difficult for us to generate, and so we don't, um, we don't always generate it every single year. And then I should stop for questions because I was going to go into a site study about, um, you asked about how we use these data for sites that are being restored. So I wanted to go into a bit of a, um, a, of a example on that, but first maybe I should take any questions that are burning. Yes, well I have one for you. Um, in the invertebrate sampling you mentioned that freezing and preserving the samples wasn't your preferred method. What would be your preferred method? Oh, no, I mentioned field picking. Oh. I would, I would prefer to just preserve the entire sample and pick it uh, under the microscope because then you get everything. Um, so this is a, a constrained count. You stop at 150. Well, it's actually constrained by both time and minutes. So you either stop at 30 person minutes roughly or you um, stop at 150, whichever comes first. And so you know you're not getting everything. Uh, you know you're biased toward the stuff that you can more easily see and catch, um, which doesn't happen if they're dead and you're picking them under the microscope. But we might never get done if we were trying to do the more detailed method. And so this allows us to do 125 wetlands every year. So that's a trade-off. That makes sense. Um, there's none in the chat right now, so you're free to keep going. Okay. So I would have Love to have used an example from Duluth, but um, this example is a little easier to explain. So we're going with one that's over in Green Bay. Um, so this is a wetland where uh, it's been diked off. So this yellow line is the dike. So this wetland is diked off from the main waters of Green Bay. And there was talk of breaching the dike and also doing some other things to try to improve fish spawning. So they, before they did any of the work, they asked us to come in and sample inside and outside of the dike and tell us um, what, what we found. And what we found is that the, the wetland fish inside the dike and outside the dike were really, really different, um, as you might imagine. Um, so, so look at the top, let me go back here. Can I go back? Yes. So look at the top species inside the dike, brook stickleback, central mud minnow, fathead minnow, really tall species. And then outside the dike, you have yellow perch, green sunfish, emerald shiner, white sucker, banded killifish, and a lot more diversity, right? So hugely, oh, and we caught a gazillion baby perch um, <laughs> at this location. Um, we often seem to hit like peak baby perch time when we sample in Green Bay. Um, so huge difference. And you know, you might have predicted that, right? Um, so here's the area before they did the restoration. And 
And here's the area afterwards with slightly higher water levels as well. But you can see they got more water in around the back edge of the dike and they channeled this. So they dug this channel to get water in here and they dug these things that they called pike fingers. So these are shallow little side channels that were dug specifically to try to entice northern pike, which is a restoration target species in Green Bay, to spawn there. And so they asked us then to come back after this work was done to come back in and they asked specifically, we thought they wanted to really try to increase the fish diversity inside and outside the dike. But what they asked for us to come back and do was specifically set nets in these areas and tell them if we thought that pike were spawning. And so it's very shallow. These are our smallest fike nets. We could just barely get them in there underwater to actually fish correctly. But we found baby northern pike. It was kind of cool. Um, so, um, so that was great. And, um, and so we, um, when we, we sampled in 2011 2000, and 2013 before the, these little, what they call pike fingers were built. And we caught a few in, um, and we didn't catch any. And then after they built these pike fingers, we caught, uh, we caught several for a couple of years in those pike fingers. So, um, so that restoration worked and that was, a, we sort of did special request sampling there. And so that's another thing about the restoration sites. If we know that restoration is going to be happening, we try to get in there before, even if it's out of order in our timeline and all that stuff, we can break those rules, go in, sample the site. So we have pre-restoration data for everybody that can get there. Um, all the taxa teams, and then they do the work on the site. And a couple of years after that, so we give the site a couple of years to recover. We come back in and sample again. And so they've got this nice comparison of before and after. And if we're lucky, we'll have a couple years of before and are able to do a couple years of after sampling. Um, and so a lot of times these sites are already on our site list and we've been sampling them. We just might have to sample them in a different year because of restoration work. Um, but there are places where wetlands have been completely obliterated. You wouldn't look, you would look at the site and you would not say it's a wetland. And we're told, oh, we're going to try to turn this back into a wetland again. Somebody got GLRI funding for that. So we'll go in and we'll sample the site, even though it's not a wetland. We'll use all the same methods. We basically get the zeros to show that <laughs> this isn't really a wetland. And then they try to turn it back into a wetland. And we come back in a few years later and say, what do we got? Did it work? But we try to keep the methods uh, the same as much as possible so that then if they want to, you know, throw that site in the mix and compare to sites nearby that are actually established wetlands and see how their site compares, they can do that because we kept the methods the same. So there's a site in Duluth where they were trying to do that. It's not a wetland. Um, we went in to document that it's not a wetland, like there's no veg. <laughs> um, they tried to get it to restore, sent us back, there's no veg. <laughs> they sent us back again, there's still no veg. So they got some problems with that one. That's why I didn't use the Duluth example. Um, they're working on it. Um, but hopefully at some point we will find more than in a, like a, really, what is it, a 10 hectare site um, or more. We'll, we'll get more than like one or two of vegetation species or just sticks of vegetation little bits of plant material that we don't dare even touch because they're like the only ones in the entire site um so the other interesting thing over in green bay back over in green bay is that they've done i don't know if you've heard about this but they've done this massive restoration effort to try to um, buffer the wave energy in this area of the bay so that more aquatic vegetation grows here and want to beef that up. And so they built this massive causeway. This is all a causeway built with dredge spoil materials and shells and rock and weird stuff um, that they built out. And um, we've been sampling this area for several years now. I don't have good results on that yet. But um, the other thing they did is they created these little islands where they hope that um, bird colonies can nest better and safer. So water bird colonies can nest better and more safely. And they have had tremendous success with that. The birds really, the birds really, really like this area. Um, but it's just, a, it's a phenomenal amount of work. If you look at what it was before, you see there's like nothing here except this little remnant of an island. And then they turn it into that. It's been 
pretty cool to observe. Okay, so this is our um, our program. We have a big public website that looks like this. It is just www.greatlakeswetlands.org. And I'm gonna show it to you live in just a second. Um, Cause you can go on this website and look around, see what sites we've sampled, see if there's any of interest in your area, request data, um, do all kinds of stuff there. And there's a mapping interface um, where you can um, click on each site and see when it's sampled and all that sort of thing. But before I do that, um, I just should acknowledge all the teams that work together to make this happen. It's a huge effort to cover the entire basin. It just really is. And of course, we've been funded um, by the GLRI since 2011. And if any of you have uh, students that might be interested in this type of work, we hire about four to six uh, summer crew to help with this effort every summer. Uh, I do. Uh, teams across the basin are also hiring field crews. So um, send them our way in, uh, in April and May, and uh, we'll see if we can fit them in. And with that, I'll take questions and show you the website. Let me see. How do I stop sharing? There it is. Do you want questions now or do you want to show the website? Whatever works for people. All right. Um, and so, yeah, if anyone has questions, put them in the chat. I have a few, but also, I don't know if you knew, I was on the first crew, the first year that the GLRI was going on doing the Great Lakes sampling. So, Who's started my team? wetland career on Uzarski's team. The Don's team. Okay. Yep. I was, I'm a, I'm a Chippewa over there. Um, okay. So you were mentioned with the restorations in, it seemed like the examples you gave, it was sites that had been identified for restoration and then the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative uh, data and monitoring helped work into that. Are there sites that have been identified because of the data that have spurred restoration and, and kind of what direction does that push uh, management? Can you say that again? Um, yeah, so Sorry. the examples you gave um, are, they, it seems like there was restoration already, um, w there was already interest in restoration and the GLRI methods for sampling and evaluation worked into that. Is mm -hmm. the data um, also pushing new sites for restoration and kind of where is that data going to really drive management in the long term? I. I'm not aware that people are using it to find sites for restoration. I feel like people have basically known where the sites are, where sites are that aren't doing well and, or that used to be wetlands and they want to be wetlands again. What it is driving is uh, targeting sites for preservation. So the Nature Conservancy has come to us quite a few times and asked us for all the data in the Green Bay area, all the data in uh, from wetlands in northern Wisconsin or northern northern Lake Michigan, to try to find the best sites that they can target to preserve and protect in some way. Um, so it seems like people feel like they know where the degraded sites are right now, and they've already been queued up in the list for a long time to try to get GLRI funding to do restoration. But it's those better sites that they're a little hesitant to pick out without uh, getting as much data as possible um, and sh because it's so hard to, um, you know, get enough money to preserve just a few sites or to protect just a few sites. And so that's what I've seen for the bigger data requests. Um, we do get tons of requests, though, of just of we're restoring this site. Can you sample before and after? And so we have data on that. And so we can prove that we've done it right. And one of the groups, um, what are they called? One of the groups that funds Great Lakes Restoration has basically mandated that anybody who's doing a coastal wetland restoration has to work with us and get us to sample before and after their restoration. Um, I think it's uh, Save Our Great Lakes, uh, something like that. Um, and so that's kind of cool. Nice. Um... Can you describe the process of getting this many collaborating organizations all moving in the same direction? Um, well, when we first, 
put the project together, we basically just, you know, contacted everybody who works in Great Lakes Coastal Wetlands and said, hey, do you want to play? And you're going to have to, you know, everybody's going to have to do everything the same way. And so people had to buy into that from the beginning. The selling point is, you know, once your crew is getting your crew to the site is the really high cost. Once you're there, if you have a little bit extra money or a little bit extra time, you can do whatever the hell you want. You know, get some more samples. Great. You know, got a grad student who's doing a side project. Perfect. But their way was paid there to get the coastal wetland monitoring data. So you do that first and then you get the data for your side project and then you move on. And so that is the the sweetener part of the deal. You know, once we kind of figured out the IBIs and things, it feels a little more monitoring than research, although we're still refining things all the time and trying to, you know, understand things better and revise things. But this lets us do research on the side if we have other funding that doesn't have to bear the entire brunt of the full cost of getting a team to all these sites. That makes sense. What's the um, guaranteed funding timeline for GLRI? For GLRI or yeah. this? Um, this, the Great Lakes Social Lesson Monitoring Program, I guess. So we are now a monitoring program. We're not a project anymore. We're a monitoring program on par with EMAP and the big ships that go out every uh, every year and have done so for 30 years and blah, blah, blah. So as long as they have funding, they're going to run this as one of those standard Great Lakes monitoring programs. Um, but who's doing the monitoring can get re gets recompeted every five years. So we have a five year uh, five year contract that we're this this group that I just showed you all the collaborators. Um, this group is the group that collects the data, but we have to re compete that every five years. And so we might get out competed at some point. Well, um, there's all the questions you have right this second. Do you want to show the website? Okay. Am I, sh am I not showing? Yep. I can see it. Yep. Okay. All right. So if you go to www.greatlakeswetlands.org, um, this is our homepage. And um, from our homepage, so we've got the mapping tools, but we've got all of our documents. So you can see all the reports and publications that we have, our sampling protocols, like our QA plan is, I don't know, 200 pages long. It, it's, it's a beast. If you have insomnia, have at it. Um, but you want to sample like we do, or you want to know exactly how we sample, it's all here. You can just download these and read to your heart's content, um, along with the reports that we provide to EPA every six months. Um, so then most of what people like to play with is the site mapping tool, and that helps them figure out uh, what wetlands have been sampled when, for what types of things, and uh, so then what data they might be interested in. Um, and so if, let me see if I just zoom in. Interactive, zoom in, zoom in. Okay, so you can click on a site, and it tells you what our site number is. You know, sites have all these weird different names. Um, so uh, we refer to everything by its site number. So we'll know exactly what you're talking about if you say site number, whatever. Um, where it is and then what years it was sampled. Um, and it doesn't look like this one says much on it. Um, so... You can see that um, we've got monitoring here for birds and endurance and um, I don't use the public view very much. So whoops. Um, so I mean, I wanted to show you what you can see just without any permissions and then we'll see, we'll show you what I can see um, when I log in. Um, yeah, it doesn't look like they've, this has been filled in. I think this would be visible, but it just wasn't, hasn't been filled in yet for the site. We're still, we're trying desperately to get this uh, built out more so that there's more. Um, this one, you can actually see uh, site photos of our site. So we're trying to get the photos up. We try to take a whole bunch of photos of each site. And so you can vicariously visit the site, see our quadrats, what we were seeing. 
that uh, that sort of thing. And we're slowly getting all of those populated. We have to vet them all because we're not allowed to have pictures of people. So all the photos have to be vetted um, and make sure there's no pictures of people before we're allowed to make them public. Um, so if you know of wetlands of particular interest, you know, you can just click and see what was sampled when. Um, okay, and that'll help you, and this one's been sampled a lot um, because it's, it's called a benchmark site, which means, oh, <laughs> I picked the one. <laughs> this is the site that I just told you in the Delusifera Harbor where they cannot get vegetation to grow, even though they've been trying desperately to turn it back into a coastal wetland. That's this one. That's why it's been sampled so much because we keep going back and like, is it a wetland yet? Is it a wetland yet? Um, this does not look well populated, but, um, this one's better. So, um, so, you know, what people were observing about the site, what the nearshore land cover was, what the disturbances were, um, that sort of thing. Um, so what vegetation, <laughs> and see, we're not supposed to sample open water, that's why it says bad zone type, because we're supposed to be sampling coastal wetlands, and of course this was the, okay, we're trying to find something to sample, but there's nothing there that looks like a wetland to sample. So anyway, you can just keep clicking around and see uh, what you're interested in. And then I'm going to go back and log in um, so that we can see a bit more. Um, okay. So one thing that you can do, zoom in a little here back to Duluth. To do sorry it takes a second to move around okay so one thing that you could do is you can say i'd like to see how all these wetlands in out that basically alois bay general area compare to each other and so um so if you have the appropriate level of permission on our website and i'll show you how to request that in just a second um, then you can compare all these sites to each other now of course they're just by site number so you maybe have another screen open so you can see which site is which but um, a number of these sites are, are restoration sites so the pickle ponds <laughs> adequate um, appropriately named because they used to have something to do with something that got a lot of discharge and made them really weird um, so they're a restoration site and you can see that they didn't look too good um, when they were sampled, uh, in, even in 2019. So they're doing restoration on them now. We'll be back in a couple of years and see if these uh, these indicators maybe improve. Um, but many of these sites, you know, the birds didn't really like most of them. <laughs> yeah, these sites, you know, the water quality doesn't look that great. And the fish are even, eh, you know. Um, you notice there's no invertebrate IBI score. So I should talk about that because as I mentioned, um, and I didn't go into it in enough detail, I just real, now realize, I said that we sample veg, fish and invertebrates by vegetation morphotype. And so we're, we have indicators for cattails. So fish and invertebrates that like cattails. We have indicators for fish and invertebrates that like to use submerged aquatic vegetation. Um, we're still, we've only got IBIs developed for just a couple of those plant morphotypes for the invertebrates. We are working on getting enough data to, so we have bulrush as well. So we're working on getting enough data to expand that. But if the sites do not contain cattail or bulrush, um, then pretty much we can't report an IBI for the invertebrates. We have the data, but we just don't have IBIs that work well yet that are, that we're confident in. So we're, we're building those out. Um, we're hoping to publish a few more, I think this year or next year, we got slowed down by COVID. Um, so hopefully those will be coming soon. But so this comparison tool can be nice, especially if, say, you're the people that are responsible for um, trying to restore the pickle ponds, and maybe you want to know how they're doing compared to some of the other wetlands around them. And it's like, well, look, they're already better than just Alouise Bay in general for the inurins. So, you know, maybe they're not as bad as we thought. Um, 
So that's how you keep an eye on it. And you can see this was the last year sample, but you can pick sites and also go back in time and compare them, um, uh, compare them across years. Um, so you can see all the sampling points. I've never played with visualized spatial trends. That's a new one. I can't even keep up with my own website. Um, the other thing that you can do is um, you can request the data download uh, of all the site IBI scores. So if you have appropriate access, so like the general public can't do this because we found that people get really confused about scores. Um, you guys probably wouldn't, but lots of people do. So that's why it's not just available. And then you can export it as an, an Excel spreadsheet or if you want just certain sites or certain years or certain types of things, we'll do custom downloads for you. So that's mostly what people do is they'll contact us and say, I want all the data. And then I'll explain how much all the data is. And they'll be like, oh. <laughs> so then we're like, we can do custom. We'll do custom downloads for you, get you just what you want. So you don't have to spend so much time just trying to, to pull out the data that you're actually interested in. So the way you do that, whoops, let's go here. Um, oh, and I need to log out because it knows that I'm already a user. Okay, so you can complete and submit a request form, um, request for data. And so you tell, you tell us what you're interested in. Um, so you guys are agency manager types. Um, so you'd probably be accessing this, you want the IBI scores, full species lists. Um, if you want the full data, then select this one, but then in the description, say you actually really want all, all the data of this type, and it'll probably be me that contacts you to talk you through the nitty gritty of the detail and of the data and make sure that you understand what it should and should not be used for. Um, and then hopefully, Usually within a couple of weeks, somebody gets back to you after you do a data request. Every once in a while we fall behind and it's like a month before we can get back to you. And don't be afraid to like go to the contact page, find my email address, cause I'm the one that responds to most of these and just email me and say, hey, did you see my data request? Oh, oh, my phone number's wrong. <laughs> I'm gonna have to get that changed. I'm glad I looked at this. It's my old phone number. They changed our, they changed our area code. So I need to do that, or not our error code, I mean our prefix. Um, okay, so while we're live on the site, are there things people want to see if I remember how to do with the website <laughs> or that I could uh, that I could show you? Don't see anything in the chat right this second. We'll see if we give people a chance to type in, but uh, I think that compare function was quite interesting. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of fun. I mean, it's it's hard if you want to compare like I want to compare a site in Duluth to a site in Lake Ontario, then you have to kind of just pick a site in Duluth and pick some sites in Lake Ontario. And there's a way to do that. You don't have to draw a square box. You can just pick the sites manually that you want to compare. Okay. Um, so it's kind of fun. Um, no, this is great. The the amount of information on that website's impressive. Um, is it everything yeah, you'd we, hoped it would be have, when you started? Pardon? Is it everything you'd hoped it would be when you started? Um, yes and no, I guess. Um, it's, it's harder to wrangle than even I had anticipated, and I'm kind of used to wrangling big stuff, um, which is why they picked me to wrangle it. Um, yeah, it's, it's a lot to, to keep track of, and um, I'm always worried that people will not understand the limits of like snapshot sampling and we'll try to draw these much bigger broader conclusions that aren't supported by snapshot sampling mm. um because the but you just you know we just don't have the the funding what's what's a problem for us right now is our funding level is the same as it was when we started in 2010 so we're still doing the same amount of work on 2010 dollars and it's it's really stretching us thin right now. Um, we'd hope to be able to build, but because people are more expensive, 
gas is more expensive. I mean, everything is more expensive. Um, and, and we haven't gotten a, basically a, like a cost of living for this project. Um, we're, we're now just fighting to maintain and just keep sampling as many sites as we sample instead of being able to add on and build. Um, so that's been a little, but you know, it's what, what EPA can do with the funding they have, but that's been a little, little frustrating for us. Well, nothing's come in, so I think you've done a great job explaining it all. <laughs> um. Yeah, and we look forward to those data requests. We work with people, often we work with people individually to just get them the data that they need. Um, you know, and we don't mind that. I don't mind spending an hour with people going over the ins and outs of, you know, how the vegetation are collected or um, how you can use the fish data or, you know, whatever, just to make sure that everybody understands. And we don't mind giving out the raw data, like, you know, that down to the, you know, how many fish were caught in each rep at a site. Um, we just want to make sure that people understand how to use it before we, before we throw it out there. And that's why you can't just download these giant data sets because they come with they come with caveats uh, for what what they're actually scientifically can be used for and not. Mm -hmm. I think that's a smart move on your part. And it, it helps. I feel like it really helps. That's what everybody says. When I talk them through the data, then they're like, oh, okay, I get it. Now I, I see how I can use the data. I know I can't do this and I can't ask that question, but I can ask all these other questions that I didn't think about. So... Hopefully we're still providing all the data that people need and just making sure that um, that they don't they use it in the best way possible and to answer their questions. Um, and grad students use our data a ton, you know, so if you end up with working with students and they need giant data sets, hey, we got giant data sets. <laughs> Great. Well, um, any other closing comments, statements? Um, not for me, but thanks for inviting me and, you know, again, just play around on the website and when you get stuck and you can't see what you want to see or what you need to see, put in a data request. We, uh, we welcome those. Wonderful. Well, thanks for your work out there in those Great Lakes wetlands and, um, it's going to be interesting to see how the data progresses over time and, uh, good luck with everything else in the future. I re really appreciate you coming in and, uh, presenting to us today. All right. No problem. Have fun out there, everybody. See ya. Bye, all.